Um, I'm wondering how many people have spent like the last week watching Tiger Kings because I feel like my intro I should be like hey all you neat nymphs and larva like <laughs> come up with a kitschy little intro <laughs> to these. <laughs> Okay, but if you haven't watched it sure. and you need some trashy TV to spend some time with in the next week, I highly recommend it. Um, but anyways, um, if you came to the last uh, bug talk, I felt like maybe I was talking a little bit over some people's heads. So I figured we'd like back it up a little bit and kind of break it down into the big three, so to speak, categories that we talk about when we think about fly fishing or fishing in general and aquatic insects. Um, and the big three groups that we are referring to are EPT is the abbreviation um, for their Latin orders. Um, that's Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera. So that is your mayflies, your stoneflies, and your caddisflies. So we're gonna talk about stoneflies today. And so marcia has got um, a document attached that we'll kind of go through as I talk, and then I'll kind of show you guys some live examples, um, live in the former sense as they have dedicated their bodies to science now and they are pickled at my house. Um, so stoneflies are one of my favorites. Um, they are definitely one of the bigger groups of aquatic insects, so they're really, really fun to fish with. You get to fish with really big flies. Um, and really big nymphs um, and really big dry flies in both the senses there. Um, so stoneflies go through aquatic incomplete metamorphosis and just to refresh everybody's memory, um, aquatic incomplete metamorphosis is a life cycle in which it starts out as an egg underwater, it emerges out into a nymph form, and then the nymph form kind of grows up under the water. It sheds its exoskeleton multiple times in these phases that are known as instars. And these are super neat in the fact that stoneflies can undergo up to four years as a nymph before they emerge out as a winged adult. So stoneflies have the longest life cycle underneath water of any of the aquatic insects. And as you can kind of see there, there's little triangulated pads and I'll show you some real ones um, as we go along here. But those little triangulated pads are its wings developing under the water and then it's gonna crawl out. These guys are pretty big. So when we talk about mayflies and even some caddisflies, they're super lightweight and tiny. So they can kind of hang in the water column there and emerge, but stoneflies are a little bit more robust in their body size. So they kind of have to crawl out to a bank to some kind of substrate or plant or, you know, log or something like that on the river bank before they can emerge. Um, then they're a little bit hardier of a bug. Like I said, they're bigger. So they're gonna have a little bit longer lifespan as an adult, a um, couple days, even up to a couple of weeks, um, depending on the species. But compared to their friends, the mayflies, mayflies can live about 24 hours. So stoneflies live substantially longer as adults. So here's a little scratch board drawing I did a couple years ago. This is a salmon fly larva. Um, or excuse me, misspoke, salmon fly nymph. So um, this nymph here is identified by the fact that it's got two antennae. And then if you can kind of see, it's got three big panels down its back. So you won't really see that in mayflies or caddisflies. When you see these three kind of shield-like panels on their back, um, that is in the thorax of the insect then you kind of know right then that it's a stone fly. And then if you look super close, and again, these are bigger, so sometimes you can really see this with the naked eye, at the end of their little feet, that's what's known as their tarsal claw. And stone flies all have two little hooks at the end of their tarsal claw. So if you see there are two little hooks there on the end, you know it's a stone fly. The other telltale factor is a long, elongated abdomen. And then these two little projections off of their abdomen that are known as circe. And circe are just um, an appendage that kinda is a motion sensor. So that's why like roaches and bugs, like you, you can't really sneak up on them from behind. You gotta kinda catch them from overhead because if you come at them from the back, those circe can tell that something's trying to sneak up on them. So um, that's kind of the breakdown of what a general generic stonefly nymph looks like. And just to correspond with that nymph, here is a drawing of a stonefly adult. And it looks pretty similar, but as you can see, it's got wings. Um, 
Stoneflies are in the order Plecoptera, and that actually translates to mean braided wing. So you can definitely see the veins in their wings, and you can see that kind of braided look to it. Um, they still have the cerci, they still have the antenna, they still have the two tarsal claws. And as insects are, they always are going to have six legs, but still kind of that same elongated look. So it's not going through complete metamorphosis because it's not totally changing. It's incomplete metamorphosis because it looks pretty similar still to that nymph form. All right. And then um, if you're following along there with Marsha, um, Stone flies live typically in like cool, highly oxygenated mountain streams. So they're only found in like the coolest, cleanest water types. Um, they emerge throughout the year. We've got winter stone flies, we've got spring stone flies, and we've got summer stone flies. Um, there are some early fall stone flies as well, but there's not really a ton of late fall ones. That's kind of the only season that we're missing out on a big stone fly hatch. Um, they kind of start in the winter with what we know as little black stones and I collected some of those actually this week. So now this is when the fun part of Maggie doing zoom hits and I'm gonna flip you guys around. So I got some little black stones here and just to give you kind of a reference that's my fingertip. So itty itty bitty. Um, stoneflies come in a variety of sizes. Um, this is a capnia stonefly, and I believe that is on the first slide there, Marsha, of the specific bugs. It's like three or four slides in. Is that on the, the PDF file? Yep. Okay. And I kind of skipped this, but... Um, Stoneflies have two different movement groups and two different functional feeding groups. Um, they can be clingers as far as movement or sprawlers. And when we talk about clingers and sprawlers in these different ecological terms, um, we're really talking about general stuff about how they move. So it's, if it's a clinger, it's clinging to a rock. Um, if it's a sprawler, it's kind of sprawled out on the bottom on detritus and on different substrate at the bottom of the river. Um, when they feed, the majority of stoneflies are going to be shredders, so they shred all the leafy goodness at the bottom of the river after the fall, and they feed on a lot of different plant material that we find um, as well. And then they can also be predators, so they're one of the meaner aquatic insects that we have and that they will also chomp um, other aquatic insects. But um, these are Capnia little black winter stones. So they are clingers and they can be predators as well. They are univoltine, so that means that they only have one generation per year. And they can be kind of a caramel brown to a dark brown to a black in color. Um, these guys didn't survive very well, but that's actually a male. He is wingless, um, so they don't get to travel very far. They kind of scatter along snowbanks in the wintertime and then eventually become trout or bird food. Um, when you're running across a white background and you're a solid black little critter, it's really hard to stay safe. Um, right there is the female version and she's got bigger wings. I'm sorry if this is blurry. I'm trying to get it to focus here. Um, but she has wings and she can fly off and kind of do her own thing a little bit more so than the males can. This other one here that's more of the caramel color is another family of winter stone. Um, but just to kind of give you reference there um, in the size wise, the winter ones are really, really tiny. Um, stonefly adults do have four wings. So you can kind of see in the caramel colored ones that there's not just two wings there, there's actually four. So that's a really good identifying feature as well. If you see stoneflies flying in the air, they kind of look like little helicopters and you can really pick out those four wings. They definitely don't look like two. Um, when we talk about the flies that you would want to use that time of year, um, I pulled out some little jig nymphs here with little black beads and kind of some black CDC and those are great imitations of the nymphs here. They're definitely not small enough. Um, hashtag quarantine couldn't go get the ones that I actually wanted to use but, um, but these are just for for viewing purposes 
um, those little black bead jig stone fly nymphs are great to use for little black winter stones. And then for the adults, we don't get a lot of opportunity to, to fish for these as adults. Um, if you get a really warm day in like March or February, you might get a chance to see them feeding on the surface, but that's basically like a black parachute Adams and a black elk hair caddis. So those are really common patterns just tied in a black color that you could use for the adult version of those. So I'm just kind of going in order of the year and how um, and how they emerge throughout the year. And hang on, Maggie just did something. Sorry, just cut you guys off. And as I said in my last deal, these little fly cups are like my favorite things to store bugs in. So I highly recommend keeping those when you go to fly shops. So after the winter stoneflies, then we start getting our spring stoneflies. So I'm gonna kind of change them out here. So they're gonna kind of get bigger as we go along. Um, so this is a little spring stonefly. Uh, it's in the family Chloroperlidae. So you can kind of see in the size compared to the little black winter ones, it's definitely bigger. So your flies are going to get a little bit bigger as well. I'm going to pick all these. Oh, and he died. Um, so that is a nymph right there. And again, sorry if you're having trouble seeing some of that. You know, for this thing to be called Zoom, I'm struggling with learning how to actually Zoom. But so that would be a nymph version and then an adult that would emerge out would be something that looks like this. So again, these guys have dedicated their bodies to science and they're not always in the best condition because they're dainty little bugs. But there's another one to, you can kind of see. Um, that one's known as the squala. So again, a little bit bigger in size, definitely bigger in the adult size. The male it has the same thing as the capnia stonefly, so it actually has shortened wing as well. Um, I know it's a squala because he's got that little light colored band on his head. And you can figure out over time um, different identifying characteristics of these bugs. But I do think it is cool to kind of see them side by side with what the actual fly is that you're using to imitate. So let's get rid of our winter bugs there. So if I'm trying to imitate these spring stone flies, these squalas, um, I would probably want to use something. You know, if I want to get really big, I've got like a little chubby here in kind of a lighter caramely gold color, kind of got a brownish goldish dubbing underneath. And if I wanted to fish a nymph version of that, um, you know, something like a pheasant tail jig, that darker color would definitely um, work. It's got kind of the same CDC collar around it as the color of the nymph there. So again, flies kind of get bigger as the year goes along. And those are squala or spring flies. Um, these guys are not going to have any noticeable gills on the nymph too and you'll see that kind of later on that's one of the indicating things about stoneflies is whether or not they have gills that are present or absent and so the way that you know that these are spring flies is because they do not have gills that are present in that little nymph form um, because remember if they're aquatic insects they're going to have to have gills in order to breathe. I'm going to get rid of those guys. So next up, um, we'll talk about little yellow sallies. So little yellow sallies are a very, very abundant stonefly in the Rockies. They are pretty much in all the bodies of water I have sampled since living out here. Um, they're just kind of a smaller spring stonefly. They have a yellow color to their body as the name might suggest. And they 
tend to have a red coloring at the rear end in the adults. So if you can see here, these are all the nymph form. So these are all the ones that live underwater. You can kind of see those three little panels across its back. And it's got its two little Circe and the long slender body. And then as far as the adults go, the adults look very similar, but just with wings. So you can kind of see there the winged version. And you can really see on that one, the four wings. So you can kind of see when they're splayed out to the side, how they have the four wings. And like I was saying, little yellow sallies are really, really common um, stoneflies that we fish with in the summertime. And they are ones that you see in abundance. Like a lot of times during stonefly hatches, you do see large quantities of them, but um, yellow sallies are definitely ones that tend to span over the course of the summer and they will they will have multiple generations over the course of the summer and so you can kind of fish them for a longer period of time than a lot of the other stoneflies so for a nymph yellow sally this is a little pheasant tail there with like a chartreuse kind of yellowish collar around it And as far as adults, anything with kind of a yellow parachute atom style, um, this one kind of has a little red in the back. And then, like I was saying on the females, you get that red coloration. That's how you know it's a female right out the gate. So that could be a female there with the little red at the rear. And then, you know, a basic like hair's ear definitely would work for a yellow sally. Um, there are really specific yellow sally nymphs, and I have some at the store, but I do not have any at home with me now. I have not stocked up yet for the summer. Um, but those are just some examples of yellow sally patterns. There's some basic like elk hair caddis style, again, with that kind of red wrap around the rear. And then one of the most popular common flies that we use for it is the stimulator. So if you've ever fished with a stimulator fly, that little guy right there, um, it is definitely an imitation of a yellow sally. So those tend to come out, um, like I said, after the little spring flies, um, but then we may have some other emergences in between those coming out, at, or the squalas coming out, and then the yellow sallies coming out. So we'll put those guys up. And as summer goes along, we're getting bigger and bigger. I was pretty bummed because I don't have a great, um, a great uh, golden stone fly nymph. Um, I'll actually show you if you're following along here, Marsha, if you want to pull the Prelodidae slide up. So there's several um, different families. This is the same. Yeah. So you can kind of see there um, what that nymph looks like. But stoneflies are also really easily identified by that kind of patterning on their back. It almost looks like a turtle shell or something. So um, a lot of times when we identify stoneflies, we're looking at those squiggly markings on them, as well as presence or absence of gills. And they have typically armpit gills is what we're looking for. So they're kind of funny bugs when you find the ones with armpit gills and you flip them over and it looks like they have big hairy armpits. Um, but perlity is the most common family of stoneflies. Um, it's actually the family of golden stoneflies. So you hear about these guys a ton. Um, again, I d easily identified by the markings on their head, so you can kind of see the hourglass marking there helps you identify it down to species versus that last one that had more of a W shape on the head. Um, but again, lots of different patterning. These guys um, actually have a little anal gill tuft on them, but they also have pretty thick armpit gills as well. Um, but like I said, I don't have an awesome sample of that one. I went looking for some, but did not find 
And actually, this is what I want. So that's a smaller version. Like I was saying, these guys go through lots of different phases before they emerge. Um, they may go through four, they may go through 40 different end stars where they molt that exoskeleton. So that picture I just showed you is a much bigger version of this same exact bug here. So this is a golden stonefly. No, and so they are again one of the more common ones we see here, at least in the Northern Rockies. And one of the main flies that you use for that, I'm sure everybody's heard about turd flies. Um, this is an example of something I would use for a golden stone nymph. This is just kind of a golden turd fly or Pat's rubber legs. Um, this is a rubber legs hare's ear that I might use for that or a version of a Kaufman stone here with the two beads so it gets down and has a little bit more depth to it. Um, but you know, a little bit bigger again, as you go along, you're gonna get bigger and bigger bugs throughout the summer. But that's a golden stonefly nymph. As far as a golden stonefly adult, this is what it would emerge out to look like. So here is a golden stone adult right there. And a fly that I might use for that would be like this guy here. Nice little bullet head stone fly pattern. Um, if you can see that little black clump on the rear end of it, that's supposed to imitate an egg uh, sac that it's about to drop over the river. So that can always be really enticing to fish. This is probably one of my more popular ones that I sell at Orvis. This is G's Superfly. That's a great golden stone fly imitation, golden stone adult. Um, I've also got Casey's Creature here. If you love googly eyes, that's always a fun fly. So again, bigger stuff, a little bit more fun. Um, circus peanut water walker there. Easy to see. That's what makes it really fun, right, in fly fishing when you can actually see your stuff that you're fishing with. Um, so then after golden stones are kind of about the same time as golden stones um typically in june and july out west we see the terra narcissus hatch and terra narcissus is the salmon fly and they're such a great example to look at because of the size of them you can really see here these are the ones that can live up to four years as nymphs under the water and so I kind of show you here generationally, you know, there's your, you're looking at your four years there. So lots of different in star phases in between, but you can kind of see these are all the same bug. It's just in a different age form. So that also dictates what size fly that you're probably going to use. Um, again, one of our best flies that we use for Salmon flies is going to be your Pat's rubber legs or your turd fly. And now you see why they come in such a variety of sizes and versions is because you've got to kind of match up with whatever's going on. So, you know, if you're hitting the river in June or July and the salmon flies have not hatched, I'd recommend going with the biggest one you can find. And I mean, there's certainly ones that are much bigger than that that are more akin to this size, like on a size two hook. But, um, they are in the river pretty much at all times if you're in a body of water that has them. So they're always, always a productive pattern to use if you know that you're in a place where salmon flies are a thing. Um, if you look up close, they're easy to identify in their nymphal phase because they don't have a lot of that patterning. They, um, it's like the drawing that I showed you. They're much darker in color. Um, they've got these more kind of razored looking wing pads. So you can kind of see it looks like body armor almost. It's super sharp. Um, Marsha, I don't know what slide that is, but um, they have gills right underneath their chest. So if you look right at their thorax there, you can kind of see that lighter colored stuff. That's all big tufts of gills right there. So again, they gotta have a breathing mechanism underneath the water. Um, so if they've got chest gills, you definitely know it's a pteranarsis. If they've got that 
big razor wing pad, you definitely know it's a Terranarchus and that kind of black color, really, really dark in color. Um, this guy is a clinger. It, he is not actually a big predator, mainly eats leaves and shreds them. Um, they are semi-bolting, so they emerge every two to four years, but because they have different generations kind of staggered out, you're going to have salmon fly hatches every year. It just kind of depends on how big and how massive it is. So that's why, like, when you hear anglers talking about getting to the river for a certain hatch, you know, I always joke, time is actually of the essence because these things are, you know, days that we're talking about that they happen. So when salmon flies go off and they're going off in droves, I mean, that's, that's like, the coolest time ever to be on the river and it's almost like getting to the river like the day it starts or the day before is always the best time to be there but you can't ever time that so you know hitting it is one of those like magical moments in angling and it can be a super fun and memorable time um so these guys being the nymphs i'm gonna kind of scoot them out of the way to make room for some adults here so i've got one there and I gotta open my big container here. Oh, some yellow Sally friends came out. But I mean, look at the size of those. I got some yellow Sally's in there for comparison. But I mean, there's quite a bit of variation in stonefly sizes. Um, when we talk about mayflies or caddisflies, um, we're going from like that to that in size version. When we're talking about stoneflies, we're going from that to that. So there is quite a bit of variation in them. But you can really see that braided wing when you look at the salmon fly up close. Um, it is easy, easy to identify, especially with the females, because they're going to have a big orange band around their neck. What stinks is when you pickle these bugs and you lose all the good coloration, because you can kind of see a little bit of like some reddish undertones along the abdomen there. Um, but they do get this bright orange band when they're alive around their neck and you should be able to see that on the slide there like yeah you can really see it on that one so that's why a lot of times when you see salmon fly flies let's see what i got over here you see lots of orange in them so this is an impala salmon fly Eek. And big, big bouncy rubber legs because they're big goofy bugs when they land over the water. Like they're just the most awkward things. It's so funny to think about how they must have evolved because they are just super awkward flyers over the water when they are trying to lay their eggs and mate. And when they come crashing down, the fish just explode on them. Um, this is a popular pattern called the cat's puke. You can kind of see that underbody kind of looks like cat's puke. It's got some squishy foam under there, so this kind of floats really well. Um, this is another local pattern that we like, the circus peanut. It could be a hopper, it can be a salmon fly. Um, and you know, any kind of Chernobyl pattern, big Chernobyl pattern could be a salmon fly. Um, you can get more realistic or more basic, but when fish are on salmon flies, it is a pretty incredible experience. But again, here's another version with a little hit of orange around that neck. And then, like I said, turds in all sizes, um, you know, jig ones, beaded ones, ones with tails, crossed with woolly buggers, are all great patterns for salmon fly nymphs. And then there are a few other, um, like I mentioned, smaller, like winter stoneflies. I didn't have a ton of um, opportunities to take any samples of those, so sadly I do not have any, but I included some information about them. I'm trying to flip it back around, um, but I included some information about them in the slideshow. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a basic rundown of stoneflies. They're one of the coolest, biggest, funnest bugs that we can fish with as anglers. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to unmute and give us your questions or type them in or send us an email later or whatever um but i think marcia you'll have an opportunity to share the pdf with everybody 
Yes, I will mail out, I will email you all the PDF and also a recording of um, the presentation. So you'll be able to go back and forth between the two of them. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? Actually, I have a question, Maggie. Um, well, I'll let, does anybody have any questions about stoneflies? Because mine might take us a little off track. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Is there a difference in presentation at all for male and female stoneflies? Yeah, so um, a lot of times you're going to see uh, sexual dimorphism. You're going to see like two different sizes in them. Typically, the female is going to be a whole lot bigger. Um, apologies for not calling that out on the salmon flies, but yes, there there are big size discrepancies. Um, the little black ones in the wintertime, the males with the shorter wings, the spring squalas, males have the shorter wings, smaller body, um, but pretty much always the female is going to be larger than the male. And at this point, you guys are you're welcome to um, unmute yourself and, and ask your question if you if you'd like, um, or you could type it and I will relay it, whichever you prefer. Totally fine. So Maggie, when you were doing the bug presentation for us in Anaconda, you mentioned sort of two different types of flies. One of them was imitation flies, and I can't remember what you called the other one. Yeah, so um, we have two different kind of groupings of flies. Um, you got a real life imitation and you've got an attractor. And so that's um, kind of what I was saying with the yellow Sally there. You've got really specific imitations. So you've got, I'm like, where's the camera? Um, that's a really specific <laughs> imitation there with the red hind end. And then the stimulator here is more of a generic kind of in the same color family, but it's more of an attention grabber with its kind of tigery looking stripes. It's more to get their attention and get them to eat it. Um, but a lot of times in like swifter water situations, you're gonna tend to use more attractor stuff because the water's moving quickly and those fish are having a split second to make a decision about something and you're going to go more match the hatch or a specific pattern when you're in a glassy water situation or spring creaky situation or where these fish are a whole lot more particular they get flies thrown at them all the time you want to be a little bit more match the hatch there um but that's what's really fun about you know salmon flies is that since it only happens one time a year, they're not super particular about it because it's not like you're throwing salmon flies for a, even a month out of the year. It's literally like a week out of the year. So they might eat this guy that doesn't really look so much like it, or they might eat this guy that looks a whole lot more realistic. Uh, what do you look for when you are on the river to decide what pattern to use? Um, I mean, I do a couple different things. I have a little kick net set up that I take with me. Um, it's like just a little fold up net screen, but I've also made a couple with stuff from the hardware store, like zip ties and mesh netting and ski poles, and you can put it together um, and it rolls up really nicely. You can throw it in the back of the boat or, or you know, take it wade fishing with you. Um, use it as your wading staff. And then um, I plant it in the river, do a little kicking, see what comes up there. But really the most indicative thing to me is I'll try and, and pump a fish's stomach. I don't do it to every fish, but if if I see a fish feeding and catch it, I like to pump its stomach. Um, I said this in my last little bug episode, but my friend Larry Salmon taught me how to make a little, um, little tube deal that I can pump a fish's stomach with without being too invasive. Um, it's just like a little tiny syringe with a piece of plastic tubing on the end and I'll fill it up with water a little bit and kind of flush the fish's stomach and pull some bugs back out and see what they've been feeding on. Um, I mean, for example, I went fishing yesterday and we couldn't get a fish to eat a nymph for anything and I'd fished that section a couple days before and we were getting to eat lots of dries and it was too windy to fish dries yesterday, but then you know, caught a fish, pumped his stomach, and he was eating all little dry midges, but it was too windy to fish dry, so that kind of, you know, changed our program, so to speak. Um, but, you know, you see what's going on on the edge of the water, on the edge of the stream. You know, if you're in a boat, lots of times dead bugs or things that are on the water will kind of congregate the foam around the bow on the edges of the boat, 
So I'll always get out and check that out. I kind of look around when I'm at the boat ramp, see if there's spider webs or anything like that around, see what's caught in it. Um, but I mean, the biggest thing is just keep changing bugs. And one thing I tell people to do a lot is just to keep changing depths as well. Um, because sometimes you might not be catching fish, but it might be because you're too shallow or you're too deep. So maybe change your depth if you think maybe your bug choice is correct. Um, your depth in the water column might be what's off. Um, one question is, I'm in the Catskills. I'm not sure we even have, have salmon flies here. Is that possible? Um, there is a species of salmon fly that does live in the east. I'm not 100% sure if you have it, but one of the resources that I wanted um, Marsha to link after this is macroinvertebrates.org because I know I speak a lot to where I live in the Northern Rockies and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But if you're on the East Coast, a great, great resource is macroinvertebrates.org. It's got all of your East Coast bugs there. Um, and if you see a bug there, then you know it lives on the East Coast and then you can kind of Google it and, and search it a little bit more. Um, another reference website that I use quite a bit is Troutnut. So you can get on trout nut as well. And he usually does a good job of like parsing out, this is the species in the West, this is the species in the East. Um, you know, because there's not a whole lot of people still doing bug work out there. I mean, like this is one of my more recent purchases and it looks like pretty ghetto and old. <laughs> so um, there are good bug books out there um, and good guidebooks, um, hatch guides to Western streams for the East and the West are both really good. Um, so you can check out the Hatch Guide to Western Streams by Ken Schollmeyer, I believe. Um, that should probably tell you that about the East Coast bugs as well. Is there a better depth to start with or might they be anywhere in the water column? Um, so that's interesting. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was about to like, you know, fringe stoneflies, there's exceptions to every everything in the insect world and probably in the animal world just in general. Um, but they typically live in the most highly oxygenated areas. So I'll try and go, like if I see a, an area that's rushing, obviously not an area that's unsafe, but if I'm, if I'm walking in a river and I see like structure and there's like a big rock and there's more kind of white water going over it, I'll tend to want to sample there versus a place where it's just kind of a lighter, softer riffle because I know in the highly oxygenated area, I'm going to likely get a stonefly. But like I was saying, there's exceptions to everything. Um, one of the more unique ones is there is the Lake Tahoe stonefly that actually lives below 100 feet deep in Lake Tahoe. And it's the only, one of the only stoneflies that lives in a lake ecosystem. Um, a lot of these bugs in the EPT families, the big three fly fishing bug families that we talk about, um, they tend to live in moving bodies of water. Not many of them actually live in lake systems. Lakes, you're going to tend to find things more like dragonflies and leeches and worms and stuff like that. Um, but stoneflies typically do not live in lakes, but they have this one that lives below 100 feet in Lake Tahoe that is ovoviviparous, so it means it can lay its own eggs. It, the females mate with themselves and lay their own eggs and are self-sufficient. So it's a very bizarre, um, strange case of the stonefly. But they don't tend to live like in super, super deep water. They tend to just live in the more oxygenated areas, wherever that might be. Like I'm not going to sample in a deep pool or anything like that and hope to find a stonefly. I'm going to sample in kind of a more shallow, more rushing water scenario. Um, one other offhand thing to mention too is a, another exception to the stonefly rules. Well, it's not really an exception, but um, the glacier stonefly is an endangered species and it's found in both Glacier National Park and on the Beartooth Highway um, and some of the bodies of water up there and then in Green Teton National Park as well. And that actually lives specifically in a melting glacier runoff that forms a high mountain, high elevation stream. So they're right at the mouth of a lake. Um, so that's oftentimes to a great place to sample if you know that you're in a body of water that has a nice like river or stream coming out of it. Sampling at the mouth where that water kind of starts rushing is a good place to sample. Um, 
but check those out. Uh, the glacier stonefly, they just got listed on the endangered species list and it's a fascinating story and they were only recently discovered. It kind of bums me out because the place where they were discovered in Grand Teton, I'm like, I used to be there all the time. I should have just been looking under the rocks the whole time. You never know when you can discover something new. Um, another question about the Tahoe stoneflies. Uh, how do they recombine genetics if they mate with themselves? That is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there, I, there's a scientific paper about it. I know you can Google it. You just Google um, like Tahoe stonefly. That's one of the first papers that will come up is, is about their mating and reproduction. Um, but again, that's the only stonefly that I know about that does that. So it's super fascinating that they have that ability. Is there a temperature that stone flies prefer, like water temperature when they're more active or when they're more dormant? Well, I mean, for emerging, there will be certain ranges of temperature for sure. Um, like, I think it's 57 to 60 degrees is what they prefer to emerge. Um, but no, I mean, they'll, like, if the water gets too cold and they're in too shallow of an area, all insects have the ability to kind of go dormant if they need to, if their bodies get too cold. Um, you know, not everybody is like a pine beetle that can convert sugars into alcohol and not freeze during the winter time. So they definitely can have dormant phases. Um, insects either go dormant in the winter time in the egg phase, the nymph phase, or the adult phase. But pretty much all stoneflies are going dormant in their nymph phase. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're not going to be like crawling around and super active in the middle of the winter, but it is pretty crazy. Like if you're around a body of water that has salmon flies or golden stones or some of the bigger, more robust bodied ones that have to crawl to the shore, they get super active in the days and weeks before they hatch out into adults. And like you can turn over rocks and you can just like pick up handfuls of them. And it's pretty crazy how active they get at those times. Very cool. Any more questions? All right. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, I will, uh, as I mentioned, I'll email this presentation and the links that Maggie mentioned and the PDF that she put together. Uh, and then if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can email me at Artemis. Um, what is it? <laughs> Artemis at nwf.org. Uh, and if you follow Maggie online, she, she posts uh, cool bug pics quite frequently. <laughs> at MPJ bug. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank y'all for coming.